and be never done. Well, I invite you to open God's Word with me as we turn to a very familiar text, but one which I think never loses its wonder or its significance. And so let's uh, turn to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2. I'm sure you can find that as you just uh, open up to your New Testament and turn one page or two. Where we're going to read the story of the Magi. Um, such an incredible story. So turn your hearts and your attention to God's Word with me. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem, in Judea, during the time of King Herod, magi, or wise men, from the east came to Jerusalem, and they asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, which is a light way of saying in the original language, greatly troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where this Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet Micah has written. But you, Bethlehem, and the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time that the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child, and as soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. And after they had heard the king, they went on their way. And the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. I'm coming to the house. They saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. So far the reading of God's word. Well, let me begin by making something perfectly clear again, in case you haven't heard me say this before, although I'm sure I have. And that's this, that I love the season of Christmas and pretty much everything that comes with it. All the way from the light displays to the eggnog. I just really think this is a wonderful time of year. And I love all the wacky Christmas traditions that many of you probably have gotten sucked into, like baking thousands of Christmas cookies, enough to feed an army, or watching another episode of Frosty the Snowman for the zillionth time. It's all good, as long as those traditions help keep us together. And that's what I especially love about this season, is that it seems to help bring people back together. And makes us all a little more aware of that intrinsic value of the relationships that we have, and, and actually of people in general as God's children, regardless of our race or our economic status. And yes, I really love the way that it nudges us all to share our time and our gifts to bless one another. And I have been so blessed, both as a child and as an adult, to enjoy that special Christmas magic, whatever that is. When family and friends come together and share the beauty of gift giving. So hear me that I am no Grinch. And in fact, I, I have hoped for that kind of joy to be felt by every child and every family, especially for those who have so little joy because of their financial hardships. And I don't even mind it when the Salvation Army bell ringers come out as they are out in full force again at the grocery stores and the shopping centers because I know what an incredible blessing that agency and so many others like it are to people in need all around us. So if there ever was a season to celebrate the joy of giving with love, this is it. 
But now I also need to confess that gift giving is far from my strongest gift. I'm afraid my record for sharing that perfect gift with the dearest people in my life leaves a lot to be desired. And I've still got a lot of work to do in those areas of sensitivity and memory and generosity and putting them all together. Which is probably why I tend to feel a lot of pressure during this season. You know what I'm talking about? And it's also probably why I get a little more critical than I should be of all of the emphasis that gets placed on gift giving and having just the right gift during this season of Christmas. And I'm sure I'm not the only one who has noticed the excellent uh, ploys of our marketing gurus out there and how they can pretty much turn anything from a tinker toy to a tablet to a new Toyota into that wonderful thing for that special Christmas magic for your loved one. And so I thought, you know, as crazy as that is, we all fall into it. And so once again in this season, as we try to remember who it is that we're worshiping, it's time for us to go back and figure out how all of this business of giving at Christmas began. You see, long before we get too carried away in our giving, we need to go back and look at this beautiful story, this amazing story of where Christmas giving became a thing. And as we do so, I'm praying that we won't just pay lip service to the fact that Jesus is the reason for the season, but that instead we might rediscover why Jesus is so worthy of the gifts that he received as our Savior King, and then be a little more inclined to share those gifts along with whatever else we might be inclined to give. You know, this is an incredible story. Probably one of the most incredible stories in the whole nativity uh, background. And no matter um, how familiar it is on your Christmas cards or, you know, in all of those images that we see out there, there is still something so amazingly captivating and almost beautifully mysterious about that picture of wise men as they're riding their camels beneath that star as they approach this somewhat uh, unknown town of Bethlehem. What could be more magnificent than seeing those respected learned men in all of their finery and, and all of that, you know, just picture of respect approaching this tiny baby and bowing down in humility as they offer their precious, unsuspected gifts, all while being under the light of that special star. Only God could have orchestrated such an incredible, beautiful scene, and he did so so that it would capture our attention, so that it would capture our imaginations and cause us to think about the significance behind it. Over the years, I know that we've allowed some artistic license to enter into this drama so that now we portray the arrival of these auspicious men on the same night as all of those other wonders surrounding Jesus' birth there in the manger. And while that's incorrect, I don't want you to lose sight of the fact that this is still an amazing, beautiful picture. In fact, what, what matters is not exactly what day they arrived in those first years of Jesus' life, but that they arrived at all. That they recognized who Jesus was, and even though they were born and raised and, and, and totally affirmed in their other life, in whatever distant land it was that they were serving, that somehow these wise men came from such a land so far away from Israel, and made that journey to offer their gifts to him is, in fact, a miracle. You know, this, this, this picture has become so sweet, almost so, so soft and, and so kind of, you know, warm and glowing on our Christmas cards that we don't really appreciate it the way that the first century Jewish audience that Matthew was writing to would have appreciated it. You see, for those first century Jewish leaders, there was nothing magical about this scene but instead, it was radical. It was, it was shocking. It was challenging to their whole worldview. It just didn't make sense. 
And you can better believe that any first century Jewish person, especially one steeped in all of their religious training, would have stopped and wondered just what this Savior was all about. And perhaps they would have really taken notice at the gifts that these mysterious travelers came to offer him. And I wonder when was the last time that you and I really did that? To really stop and think about just how radical it was that these men came from the Far East. So without any intentions of ending gift giving, let's take a moment to consider what kind of gifts that these gentlemen gave and how we might include them. So first and foremost, I want you to notice the word there at the end of verse 2 in this uh, opening sequence. When these men arrived there in Jerusalem in search of Jesus, after making it to that capital city of the land of the Jews, which they were led to, not only by the star that they saw rising back in their homeland, but probably and most likely also by their intense study of Jewish literature in the prophetic tradition. They now came to Jerusalem and asked with complete confidence, thinking that, of course, these people would know what it is that we're searching for. When they said, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east that arose in the east, and we have come to what? To worship. They didn't say we've come to see and speculate and, and maybe goo and gaw and just kind of, you know, wonder if any of this could possibly be true. No, they were certain, they were fully committed that this child, wherever he was, was actually the king, the ruler that they had been foretold and waiting for. They knew that this child was worthy of their worship, of their utmost honor and devotion and that by so giving it that they too would be blessed, that they would be all, all, all somehow included within his reign. And that's why it makes it even more striking and, and, and more kind of repulsive in a way that Herod, who was this half-Jewish ruler and who professed to be a loyal worshiper of God at the temple there in Jerusalem and, and devoted so much of his time and his his creativity and his wealth into expanding and, and making that temple more beautiful. How crazy is it that we see just how sinister and despicable he was in contrast to the worship that these wise men were offering. That he would even confer with his chief priests and his renowned teachers of the law who knew all about those prophecies concerning this amazing news that he would hear it told by those people reading from the prophet Micah some four to five hundred years earlier. And yet his heart was still more set on killing this promised child king than on worshiping him. Even though Herod saw and understood that their quest to find this holy child was, was allowed and initiated by the by the sudden appearance of a new star, the morning star that is prophesied already by Balaam back in Numbers and talked about again in different places in Scripture. Even though something so miraculous as that happened, Herod saw this arrival as more of a threat to his own power and his kingdom-building plans than something for which to give joy. See, I think most of us admire those wise, those wise men for embarking on this quest, but, but I'm not sure that we fully try to enter into what it means for these privileged guys who probably had a lot of wealth and a lot of prestige to give that all up and make this trip. You see, I, I've always in my mind kind of pictured them as these very privileged guys, probably born with a silver spoon, sitting up in their ivory tower somewhere with too much time on their hands and too much wealth. And so as they gaze into the stars every night, how cool is that that we have this new star to follow? You know, it's kind of like a new adventure. I always imagine those expensive gifts that they brought along as something they picked up at the royal shop, you know, on their way out of town. Easy peasy. But what I never really stopped to think about was what must have been involved 
for them to, to leave their homes, to leave their jobs, which were likely, most likely, under the employ of whatever king it was whose rule they were under. Likely in Persia or maybe some far eastern land just outside of the Roman Empire. Don't think that the kings in that area were slackers or that they were ignorant. There's, there's probably no way that these guys could have embarked on this journey and, and gathered all that they needed without being noticed by the rulers of the land that they served. Because their amazing special knowledge of astrology and all of the training and language and history and, and the education that they had to understand things like commerce and trade and, and all of the implications of such a king would have been very valuable for whatever king it was they served. And so I'm sure they had to ask permission in a way and, and maybe even get financial backing from these overlords in their region. Needless to say, they had to risk a lot on taking this trip, financially and politically. In fact, these men probably knew that their chances of ever coming back and getting reestablished as they were with all that they had, if this prophecy did not turn out to be legitimate and true, would probably be at risk as well. And yet this sign, this sign of that star demanded, it demanded that they leave, it demanded that they go, that they risk everything in search of such a king. No matter what, they wouldn't miss this chance to know him, to see him, and to serve him. That's what's so amazing about this story. That these men would do that kind of a journey, that they would have the foresight to risk so much to offer not only these gifts, but their hearts and their lives to this king, while those in Jerusalem and Judea totally missed it. And in fact, resisted it. You see, the first gift, the first gift that we're shown that is so important the gift that, that is necessary when we understand what it is that has happened here is the gift of our worship, our total devotion, our undivided attention and commitment to find Him, to seek Him, to know Him, and to let Him be our King. Somehow, by God's grace, these exceptionally wise men were able to see that. And the star was the first clue but as they followed that star to Jerusalem and found out that this king was actually not interested in offering the kind of worship that he, he desired or professed to give, then they realized that something very different was going on here. And perhaps somehow God showed them something so special about this king and the gifts that they brought. So let's take a moment to see what those gifts are. What do these gifts mean that they were so eager and faithful to give him? The first gift means that they had come to know more than anything else that this son of Mary was royalty. Incredible royalty. Royalty that was worthy of our wealth and our honor and our tribute as the king of all kings. And so this precious metal, this, this metal that has been recognized as the most precious of metals from the most ancient of times because of its rarity, because of its way that it shines with radiance as the light comes on it, the sparkle of gold, is, is a symbol of wealth and honor. It's a symbol of, of radiating um, glory and splendor. And so, yes, it's a gift fit for a king. And it meant that as they presented that gift to him, that their wealth and, and their gifts and their kingdom building plans were, were somehow connected to this king. And so, whatever it is, whatever station it is, our gift of wealth and honor is represented in that gift of gold to this king that they recognized. But secondly, this gift of incense, fine incense, ground herbs that, that had a particular kind of aroma and smell when they were burned. As they presented this newborn king with this fine incense, it also showed that they understood he was worthy of our prayers. That in fact, he was our high priest. That this incredibly royal king should be the object and the mediator of our prayers. 
As we offer our prayers to God no longer through the priest there at the altar where the priest had to prepare the way and, and allow this incense to provide sort of that context and aroma for our prayers to go up as his people. Now they understood that this baby in the manger, who I know was no longer in the manger and now is in a lowly home in Bethlehem, but that this small child would someday be their high priest, that their prayers would be directed to and through him to the God of heaven and earth. Somehow they understood that this tiny child would become the one to whom we offer our confession as we seek God's mercy, as we seek God's protection and provision for this life in whatever battles it is that we face. And yes, in whatever kingdom building plans we might have. Incredible. And finally, in the last gift that they presented him with murder, it meant that they also understood that he would only fulfill all of these things, that he would only become our king and our high priest by in fact dying. By having to go through the, the pain of death, the sacrifice as the very lamb of God. As they probably no doubt studied the prophecies of Isaiah 53 and so many others that, that pointed to this suffering servant who would become the king. Not by power, by force, but by sacrifice and by love. A love that was willing to go further than anything imaginable by any king before or since. This myrrh would not remove the pain of his death, but it would show that the stench would be overcome, that the decay that would otherwise rob and corrupt would now suddenly be somehow the victory. As this precious ointment was given in the sure hope that his death would not be the end, but that it would in fact be the beginning of his reign. See, these are the gifts that are fitting for such a savior as Jesus was born to be our king, our high priest, and our sacrificial lamb. The one on whom God would lay all the sins of the world and then honor him and raise him to such a position of authority that in fact one day when we see him for who he is, every knee will bow and every tongue profess that he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. How is it that these prophets could, or that these wise men could understand the meaning of those prophetic words given so long ago in a foreign language? Well, there's one principle here that I hope you don't forget. It's probably the most important principle of all. And that is this, that the more that we surrender ourselves completely to seek him, to seek to know him, to seek and yearn to worship him, to know him intimately, the more God reveals about his truth and his light. And so if you're wondering why don't all of these things become clear to you, why, why is it possible that so many people can miss it? It's because their hearts are not oriented to seek him. Herod had no desire to really find who this Messiah was. He just wanted to stay on his throne. He wanted to maintain his power. He wanted to maintain his comfort. And the more that we do that, the more blind we become to who this Jesus really is. And so if you want to know his glory, if you want to know the power and the majesty of that baby, that boy child, and yes, even that suffering servant, seek him. Seek him above all. Whatever treasures you have or, or kingdoms you may have, Jesus said it's, it's like that man who sells everything in order to buy that one precious pearl and then buys land so that he can put that precious pearl somewhere where nobody can rob it from him. How do we do that? By keeping Jesus first. By not letting anything else become more valuable, become more important, become somehow more of our focus than him. Even as God blesses us, even as God allows us to celebrate and share gifts 
that we never would have imagined that we could have shared 10 or 15 years ago. Don't stop seeking Him, to know Him, to love Him. And wow, will He ever reveal more than we can imagine. Lastly, as we do that, as we seek to worship Him, and as we give more of our gifts and our treasures in order to give Him the honor that He's due, we never become more poor. We never become somehow more impoverished or lose our position. But in fact, like these magi who were unknown before, whose, whose, whose presence throughout history would have been lost if they had stayed there in Persia and, and never heeded this call to come worship Jesus there, now they are among some of the most known figures in history. And they become our examples of true wisdom as men who knew how to follow the light of God's truth. What kind of honor and dignity and legacy are you hoping to leave? The more that you give of those treasures that God has given you and the more that you recognize how it is that his death became the path to victory, and so follow him and so sacrifice and also allow yourself to die as you give. As you allow yourself to be humiliated and humbled as you bow to worship him and put all of the glory and all of the focus on him. I promise you, you will never be sorry. But in fact, when our king does come and when his glory is revealed, you too will share it. And you too will be honored. Because the reward of those who give all to follow him, we're promised over and over again, is a reward that Jesus is faithful to provide. The reward of more honor, more authority, and in fact, more understanding of what it means to be one with Christ. Would you pray with me that that kind of giving would focus our hearts this Christmas? Heavenly Father, I thank you again for this picture, this remarkable, stunning picture of worshipers. Father, that challenges us in the midst of this crazy world to give all, to risk all, to sacrifice all, to seek you. And Father, may you make us that kind of people, the kind of children who know you and love you and want to give you more honor want to point more people to your light. And Father, forgive us for those times when we act more like the chief scribes and the, the religious leaders who are really more concerned about keeping their own position. Father, we pray, may your kingdom come. And we pray, come quickly, Lord Jesus, and let your kingdom rule in our hearts and shine through our lives as we give the gifts that you have given us. In Jesus' name, all God's people say. Amen.